Hey, you're back with the Get Out of Deck Guy podcast. I'm Steve Rode, the older Get Out of Deck Guy. And with me, as always, is Damon Day, the younger Get Out of Deck Guy. So we're t- younger, but still have a gray beard. So we are very seasoned. <laughs> well, hey, I could have one of those if I let it grow. Today we're yeah, but I, I still got hair on the top, so I'm I'm younger. Yeah, all right, we'll go with that. Today we're talking about uh, <laughs> credit counseling, and we're going to talk about the history of credit counseling, where it came from, what it's been used for, and where it is today. Damon, you have any other points about credit counseling you want to cover? Well, when we start talking about the history and where it came from and all that stuff, mm-hmm. Steve is the man for that because Steve as he mentioned, is very old. Very he old. was alive at the inception of credit counseling, and he actually ran a credit counseling yeah. company for many, many years. So he has a lot of experience. He knows what he's talking about. I am, of course, on the younger, fresher side. I can speak more to what credit counseling has possibly become yeah. versus what it started out as. That, so that we're just going to be a true. good mix today. Uh, so, you know, credit counseling goes back a lot farther than, than people think. Uh, The first credit counseling organization kind of group effort began in the late 1960s as an outgrowth of small loan finance companies. They wanted to find a way to help people that weren't making their payments to get back on track. However, uh, ultimately, credit counseling straggled up through the 1940s and 50s Because there were companies that were popping up that were, we can now call them scam companies, that were called debt poolers. And they would uh, have people pay all their money to them, and they would then in turn pay their bills. And they started charging more and more fees. So this whole idea of credit counseling started, and then it began as a, a, a nonprofit organization. And this is a key point, Damon. I hope everybody understands is that while a nonprofit organization might be called charitable or a charity, what most people fail to understand is a nonprofit organization has to make a profit because they have to stay in business. The nonprofit term just uh, is about their tax status. They don't pay tax on the profit that they make. That's why they're nonprofit. So even though you might think that these are charities, they are, in fact, paying lots of money and sometimes hundreds of thousands of dollars to the people that run them. So they're not exactly what you think they are. So credit counseling then kind of settled in with that, um, let's get together and help our people pay and help them make a budget to repay the small loan finance companies back in the late 60s, 70s. I got involved in credit counseling in the early 1990s, and I, I became involved in helping people with financial problems, having lived through financial problems myself. And I didn't want to go. I had no idea about the whole credit counseling route. Uh, it was just a small company a friend of mine and I started to help people, to advise them. And when we called creditors to try to work out payment plans, they would say, well, are you a credit counseling organization? And I said, no. And they said, well, you should be because if you are, then we cut the payment in half and we give you 15% of the payment back to help fund your operation. And I was like, do tell. And then the next phone call he made, (laughs) then the next phone call he made is, are you a credit counseling organization? (laughs) Well, yes, yes, I am. (laughs) Well, it didn't take long before... uh, we started calling creditors and instead of saying, you know, Hey, can you help support us and pay us so that uh, our customers don't have to, we just started with the presumptive close. Like you're giving us 15%, right? Yeah. All right. So that went on for like six months until we decided, Oh, screw it. Let's just start in a nonprofit credit counseling group and it'll just make everything so much easier. And it was easy in the beginning that when you went to a credit counseling group, like the one that we started, your monthly payment was cut in half and your interest would go to zero. So yeah. that gave people breathing room that they needed to regroup and you know, try to deal with their finances. So, oh, Steve, before mm-hmm. we get too much, before we get too much into it, we should probably 
for those that don't know what credit counseling actually is, yeah. they might not even you know, know, right? So you've got, you know, you hear the term credit counseling. You might also hear the term DMP or debt management plan. Yeah. These are the programs that like, if you call your creditor and you tell them you're struggling, you've still been making your payments and you call and, hey, I can't pay the bill. They'll refer you to, a lot of times to an 800 number. That's like a credit counseling yeah. program. That's the kind of program they're going to refer you to where they're going to say, okay, you've got $25,000 in debt. We'll negotiate with your creditors. We'll try to lower your interest rates. And then you make one payment. That's essentially what we're talking about when, you, when you're in debt and you're getting these flyers in the mail and you're going to get you know, sales pitches from debt settlement companies, also credit counseling companies that are different. Um, so it's just part of the process, part of the, 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 you know, one of the groups that you're probably going to be talking to if you're in debt and you're getting these flyers and you're getting these solicitations. Um, and so today we're going to be really focusing on what exactly credit counseling is and how it may be different than debt settlement and, and really what you need to focus on to know if it's a good option for your situation. The, so, sorry, let's no problem. throw that out there. The irony here is that when I was going through my tough financial problems in the late 1980s and 1990, I contacted some credit counseling groups at that time, and they said, hey, you can't afford our payment. Um, too bad. So sad. You know, go have a good life. So there wasn't any help yeah. available unless you could make their payment. And uh, there's so much of a misperception of people thinking, oh, you got to be pushed towards credit counseling and, you know, they're nonprofit and they will help improve your life and everything else. When I started the, the credit counseling organization and people had their payments cut in half, yeah, they got breathing room. They could, they could regroup. But along the way, credit counseling really started to change in the 1990s and early 2000s. And it became a pay-for-performance uh, debt collection operation by all credit counselors who were getting their money from the creditors in the amount that they recovered or in grants. And uh, creditors, if you charged any sort of fees, they would cut you off. So creditors were controlling the purse strings and credit counseling groups were just kind of doing the dance. And in the, in the early 2000s, that's when I said, no, uh, if I have to make a decision between who my allegiance is towards the creditors or the consumers, peace out, man. I am not, I'm not doing that. And so I wound up the credit. Peace. Yeah. I wound up the credit counseling group <laughs> and uh, went and did something else. But so things have really changed along the way. I think that one of the biggest misperceptions about credit counseling, uh, two things actually. Number one, uh, uh, one of the foundations of credit counseling is you have to make a budget and then they give you budget counseling and they talk to you, you know, about where you can cut back and everything else. I have said it for many years, budgets are nothing but a page of lies. And unless you've got a good grip on where your money's actually going, it's a total waste of time to do a budget. Yeah. And especially to make a budget that's going to cut out everything that's fun or sustainable in your life. You're you're not going to stick with it, and you're going to fail. Uh, the second, and then good luck getting your spouse on board yeah. with your budget. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's always the big. Eh, it ain't going to work, <laughs> especially if they don't know about the situation to begin with. And and your kids. Uh, <laughs> it's like the easy part is to make the budget. The hard part is to convince the rest of the family that this is the budget. <laughs> well, money problems are never about the money, right? It's always about the underlying issue that got to to the point where you are today. Debt is nothing more than the symptom of the underlying problem. And through the years and the, gosh, you know, tens of thousands of people that we helped uh, through my organization, I have run into so many people who were so deep in debt, but were unable to emotionally make the hard choices to get things regrouped and get back on track. And so they, they wound up yeah. struggling for many years or struggling because they were so afraid of other solutions, whether it's, you know, bankruptcy or debt settlement. and I, me personally, I've done them all. Damon, uh, you, you've done them all too. I, I think the only thing that you, them all. you haven't done is you've never enrolled in a credit counseling program. That is true. Right. I have never enrolled in a credit counseling program, although I have done to a certain extent what credit counselors do yeah, absolutely. for clients, yeah. but I've never personally enrolled in a credit counseling program because I was never in a situation where it made sense. And, and, and really that's what it comes down to. If you're going to 
get into a program or go down a strategy, you know, a rabbit hole for, I don't care if it's bankruptcy, debt settlement, credit counseling, Dave Ramsey, whatever. The key is, is that the right strategy for you at that time, Yeah. right? Based on your situation and what's important to you, does this make sense? And that's, that's where the big, to me, the disconnect is between the, the word credit counseling and the actual service. Not a lot of counseling going on no, anymore. No, <laughs> really, you know, credit counseling just really applies to, uh, and this is when, when creditors were saying, hey, you need to make sure your staff is certified. Well, like, certified in what? You, you want us to make, <laughs> you know, make sure the budget says this before we can put them in your program. So, and I would ask them all that question. And they would go like, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I remember once. Yeah. And then, hmm? I was say, then if the budget does, you see this all the time, because sometimes clients will send me the budgets that the credit yeah. counseling company has put together for the client and I look at it. And so what they'll just, like you said, a page of lies, you'll just write down yeah. some rudimentary numbers, don't really mean anything. And, oh, it's over. It doesn't fit. You won't be able to afford it. You're $100, yeah. you know, short. Oh. So well, are you sure this. your food budget is 500? Maybe it's only 400. Oh, four. Oh, now you qualify for right. our program. Yeah, now you're enrolled. Shocker. <laughs> yeah, let me figure out a way to get you enrolled. So why are we doing this dance, you know? I was talking to a what creditor I... once on behalf of a client, <laughs> and uh, she goes, well, I need a budget before we can enroll them. And I said, well, we'll have a budget for you in about two weeks, because right now they're gathering data, and we're figuring it, that out. And she goes, that's ridiculous. What do you have them do? Write down all their expenses? <laughs> well. She's like, yeah. just make up some numbers so I can put it in the computer and we don't have to have another phone call. I remember one credit counseling group check a box. that was just submitting the same budget for all their clients. <laughs> hey, if it ain't broke, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> this one passes the computer smell test. Let's just submit this. Nobody's looking at it. Well, here's the bottom line. I have I have lots of stories that I will not share publicly about things that I've done for clients <laughs> on the phone with the creditor. I will carry them with me to my grave. <laughs> well, we had uh, we had twenty thousand clients, and so one of the things that uh, we found was that people will tend to overestimate their income by about twenty five percent and underestimate their expenses by the same amount, and so none of those budgets are any sort of accurate. But the most important point to me along the way, after I bailed out of the credit counseling world and said, I'm not selling my clients out, um, the most important thing was when I first started, I was all about, in fact, I used to run ads that said, avoid bankruptcy, we can help. And that was true. But by the time that I closed down the credit counseling group, I was all about we really need to consider bankruptcy maybe even first sometimes because the one thing the credit counselors were now running into was the payments were not cut as much. Sometimes the monthly credit count counseling payments, while the interest might be lower, your payment might be the same or even a little higher. It just wasn't sustainable. Yeah. So the key point is, is this the right solution for you? And, and Damon, this is why it's so important for people to talk to you. And they can find you at Damon, D-A-M-O-N-D-A-Y.com, DamonDay.com. It's, it's because what people need to do with a friend's help or your help is they need to get a clean slate and better understand what is myth, uh, what is fiction, and what is just general bullshit. And then make an educated decision about what is right for them. If, if yeah. you say to somebody, look, you're in your late 40s, early 50s, you want to go into a credit counseling program, you're going to eat beans and rice for the next five years, you're going to try to make all of your payments, uh, and in doing that, you're going to sacrifice more than a million dollars that you could have had in retirement. Does it, is it more moral to sacrifice your retirement? Or, you know, uh, these are tough times and tough circumstances. The other question that people never ask is, and it blows my mind, is they never ask their credit counseling agency, does this really work? What is your success rate? How many people actually pay off all of their debt? 
And the real numbers are alarming. <laughs> it's not that successful. Most people fail. And it's then it's a total waste of time. Yeah, you know, I, I get quite a few clients that um, found us or found me after they've already enrolled in a credit counseling program mm -hmm. because that's what, you know, they called their creditor. Their creditor sent them there. They got a mm -hmm. flyer in the mail, whatever it was. And it sounded good because, oh, yeah, I've got this debt. I can't keep up. I'm starting to fall behind. I'm paying 25% interest. And this is the kind of the key here. A lot of people always just laser focus on the interest yeah. rate. And just because you get a lower interest rate on something doesn't necessarily mean it's a better deal. In fact, oftentimes it doesn't mean it's a good deal because one thing that people are focused on when they have debt is the debt and the interest rate. But what they're not focused on is the cash flow burden, the monthly cash flow that yep. is coming out of their you know, relatively fixed income. You know, if you've got a W-2 job, you make about the same amount of money every month. Just because you're lowering the interest rate, if that doesn't significantly decrease the amount that you're having to contribute towards that debt repayment, that could be a, a, a different problem that you have currently, but still a big problem. And that's why when you talk about acceptance rate, or not acceptance rate, uh, completion rate, right. uh, now I'm getting my DoorDash in my head, I think about <laughs> acceptance rates. <laughs> that different podcast. But but that's why it's a lot of people end up dropping out of Chapter 13 bankruptcies right. and credit counseling yeah, they're programs not sustainable. because the the budgets, the page of lies mm -hmm. that said they could afford this payment was just that, a page of lies. And once they get six months in, it becomes very clear, man, we can't afford this $1,000 a month every month for the next right. 40 months or whatever it's going to be. And then they end up having to drop out of that and say, hey, let's take an, another look at this and see how how we can do it. But essentially, those credit counseling programs are quite simply just taking the debts that you have. Mm -hmm. They are pre, you know, pre-negotiating the rates with the creditors because they're already done ahead well, of time. They're I think negotiation stone. is negotiating is a misnomer. No, they're word. being told what the terms. Yeah, are. well, yeah. that's why I said it's 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 already set. Yeah. So the, they'll be able to give you a quote. And there there are situations where credit counseling does make sense, especially depending on the client's personality and what they're comfortable with and what's important to them. Yeah. But Credit counseling is definitely not a cure-all, which the way it's pitched, just like anything else, oh, you have debt, you got to enroll in our credit counseling program. There's a lot of downfalls to the credit counseling program that most consumers are not made aware of, and we'll get into that. Well, here's, here's a question. Uh, we have not practiced any of this, so Damon does not know oh, we don't what I'm going to ask. No, practice? No, no. <laughs> I don't even have notes. <laughs> hey, I'm winging it, bro. Hey, I got some notes. <laughs> See, I don't even have that. So, what what if, you probably won't be in the intro, but I didn't even know we we're going to do two podcasts right now. One's for our other channel, our Penny Stupid channel, yeah. where we do side hustles and help people make extra money. If you're not subscribed, you should because we're going to be huge on that That's one. That's right, Penny Stupid on YouTube, Penny Stupid Project. Yep. But yeah, on YouTube. So we got on this. I thought we were coming on talking about DoorDash, and Steve said, "Hey, welcome back to the Get Out of Debt guy." And my brain went, "Oh, <laughs> we're talking about credit counseling." All Shows right, shows how prepared I am for this one. I'm winging it, baby. <laughs> well, that's you're keeping it as real as possible, that's for sure. So, somebody runs into a difficult issue. They get laid off, they're injured, they're unexpectedly in the hospital or whatever, and they can't make ends meet. And now they feel like a moral failure. I, you know, I have to do everything I can. I have to eat beans and rice. We need to cut everything out of our lives. The kids need to, you know, whatever, be taken out of every program they're in. And I need to repay this debt because society is telling me that I will be a failure if I don't. I'm going to be a loser. My church and uh, all the Christians that I know and are going to hate me. And um, I, I have to repay my debt. So that's people do feel that way. Now, let me re yeah. rephrase that same situation. You're a farmer. And Farmers every year take the money to buy seed and fertilizer, prepare the land. You plant the crop, and it doesn't rain, and the crop doesn't come up. Are is that a moral failure on your part? I mean, sometimes does shit just not happen? <laughs> yeah. Why? No, why do? That's... Why do we have to pay for that for the rest of our lives? Not being able to save for retirement. Um, not learning a lesson that helps us to do better moving forward. And instead, uh, a lot of people that we talk to, maybe most, are so focused on trying to repair the past that they can't take an educated, clean sheet view of what is best for them and their families 
moving forward. And, and you run into this all the time. Yeah. And those are, I mean, those are absolutely valid feelings, right? Yeah. So what I like to do in those situations, and again, I'm not the guy that you don't call me and, and I say, well, here's your answer. You have to do this and you have to do right. this because I say you have to do this. That's, that's not how it works. My job is to look at that situation and say, okay, here's some possible options and go through the gamut. Let's look at all these different scenarios. Yeah. Every scenario we look at is going to have pros and it's going to have cons. None of them are going to be fun because any scenario, we have debt and we can't afford it, right? Any scenario we look at to get out of that debt is going to involve sacrifice, mm -hmm. some form of sacrifice, and whether it's a lifestyle sacrifice with Dave Ramsey's tiny feet and eating beans and rice and all that, or it's maybe a credit score sacrifice or um, a, like, what'd you call it? A, a moral sacrifice, mm -hmm. even though I don't, I wouldn't call it a moral sacrifice, but that's how a client might view like a bankruptcy where you take a hit to your credit and they feel like a failure or whatever. No matter what we do, it's going to require a sacrifice. So the best thing you can do is take a step back and just look at each of those solutions that could possibly work. Look at the pros, look at the cons and really understand what the cons are. Like you mentioned, oh, all my friends are going to know I filed bankruptcy. No, they won't. The only reason some of my family know that I filed bankruptcy is because it's on the homepage of my website. Right. <laughs> I wrote it up there. <laughs> Otherwise, nobody's going to know, you know, and even if they did, so what, you know, would you rather languish in debt? And again, do you have a, a higher obligation to strangers that may or may not think, uh, you know, bad about you versus, you know, taking care of your kids, right? So it's just important that whatever decision you make, you need to make sure you take the time to gather the information, think those strategies through and make a good informed decision. And it doesn't mean there's a right decision and a wrong decision, but there is a right decision for you. So you need to make the right decision for you and your family. And it's not up to me to say, hey, that's bad. I can say, hey, if you go down this path, this is what's going to be required of you. This is what you're going to have to do. And then it's up to you as the client to decide, can I handle that? Is that something that I want to do? And a lot of times, uh, you know, if a client's not ready to go what I call aggressive or drastic, mm -hmm. like down like a debt settlement path or a bankruptcy path, even if the numbers are really saying go this way, the client really doesn't want to do that. In fact, I had one, uh, a client just uh, yesterday sent me an email and we were kind of leaning towards a settlement in their situation. And she just emailed me, you know, and a lot of times we'll do a consult and it's just a lot of information that I'll drop on a client and then say, hey, let's take a couple days, let's take a week. Let's really think about it, absorb everything I said. Mm -hmm. Right. And then let's regroup. Let's, now that you've had time to absorb That's and think a good about approach. It. She sent me an email. Yeah. And she said, you know, I, I was leaning that way, but I'm just, I'm starting to not feel good about that. I don't like that. I really want to talk some more. Okay, great. And then now we're going to meet again and we're going to go back through, okay, if we want to avoid this, we, here's what we're going to need. And we can, we can do that. And then we can set up a strategy if they say, I don't know if I can do it, but I really, I'm more comfortable with the more traditional approach. Hmm? There's no rule that says, well, let's set up a strategy that involves this traditional approach. Let's give it a, the old college try. Yeah. See if we can pull it off. Let's give it a couple of months. Right. Like if this is what you're comfortable doing. And then through that process, maybe it works out. Maybe they can find those lifestyle sacrifices and they can make it work out. And they're aware of the potential amount of money it could cost them in the future. And they're okay with that. It's their decision. Yeah. Or, or maybe it doesn't work out. Maybe we go through three or four months and go, oh my gosh, I'm living hand to mouth. I'm barely making it. I can't see myself living like this for the next four years. Right. I didn't really like that settlement or I didn't really like that bankruptcy strategy. I just felt it was immoral or whatever. But now I, I've had three or four months to really process what this is going to take well, to avoid that. Now I'd like to revisit that. Maybe tell me some more about it because maybe it's not as bad as what I'm currently doing. And, you know, everybody's different. I, I always wanted people to ask me any question that they could because I don't, I just like you, Damon, I've never judged anybody that's in debt. I, I want to give them all the information. So they can make glass a, houses, baby, an educated decision, <laughs> and then you know, you do you. Uh, you know, yeah. I'm here to help you. I'm never in a position to judge on debt. I've had it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we both been there. I'm the I'm the king of debt. It's almost kind of like a little bit of a game. How am I going to get rid of this debt? <laughs> hey, when I went through my financial problems, I felt the same way that everybody normally does. I felt like a a loser. Yeah. I was embarrassed. I was ashamed. I didn't want to talk about it. In fact, I didn't mention it to anybody for four years i lived with that until one day i woke up and went wait a minute <laughs> but and that's how people end up making bad decisions yeah they don't want to talk to anybody about it and then they get on the phone with like a credit counselor or a debt settlement person or even a bankruptcy attorney or whatever 
and it, the sales pitch sounds good. It's my, you know, my life is crashing in on me. I haven't talked to anybody about it. I feel trapped. This guy has a plan. It sounds my payments are yeah. going to get lowered. Okay, let's do. I'm going to do that. But that's that's the extent. Yeah, that's the extent of the research because they just get to a point where that sounds good. They just want it handled. Okay, right. I'm going to send this money to this company and it's going to be handled. And unfortunately, that's not always the case. It just sounded really good. Right. People jump and leap at the first thing that sounds good because they don't want to deal with it anymore. And they also really don't know what they're doing. It's very difficult to make a good decision if you don't know the questions to ask and you don't know, you know, what's true and what's not. So, yeah. uh, you know, credit counseling. Oh, I just kicked the trash can. How about that? There we go. Um, so credit counseling. Kick the can down the street. <laughs> credit counseling can be a solution for some people. It should not be just an automatic, hey, I was pushed to credit counseling. Somebody else told me what to do. This is the most ridiculous thing, Damon. It drives me crazy. Is somebody says, hey, my creditor told me to call this toll-free number and got me in touch with the credit counseling group. And they enrolled me in this uh, monthly payment program, this debt management plan. And I'm making my payment to them. They're paying the creditors. And everything's great. Right. And again, they don't realize what the future hit is to them. The credit counseling group wants to enroll you because that's how they make money. They don't really care that you're sacrificing your retirement down the line. They're there to sell you a widget. As much as we vilify the debt settlement companies and the small loan companies uh, for, you know, taking advantage of people, uh, credit counseling groups, while well intentioned, and maybe uh, em employing very well-meaning people, they have been so indoctrinated that every other solution is bad that they unconsciously talk people into credit counseling even when somebody with the least bit of financial expertise could look at it and go, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> yeah. I remember. Yeah, I mean... Hmm? Go ahead. What do no, you I, re I, I remember <laughs> that uh, national organization, Credit Counseling, one year, I got a bunch of crap for this. Uh, one year came out with this. This is the, the client of the year. This is our best shining example of how we've, we've helped. And it was a woman. <laughs> and you're like, uh. <laughs> yeah. I was like, wait, wait a minute here. Because it was a, an older woman whose husband had dementia. And she was going to have to enroll in the credit counseling program, make payments, go back to work to make money to make the payments at the same time that he is losing his mind. How, how in the world uh, is that more moral than instead being there for your husband who is fading away? You know, that's not something, I don't think that's something to be celebrated, but you know, hey, you do you, boo. Um, and, well, and uh, go ahead. So I was going to say, so let's, let's talk to, about modern day credit counseling and what it is. Cause we're not, we're not picking on it as, as a way to say, oh, oh, it's a scam. It's this, that, and the other. It's a legitimate yeah. actual program. Yeah. It's just like anything else. It's just not sold correctly. No, it's sold to everybody that calls in with debt unless the numbers on the sheet don't match up. Right. And let's talk about why these credit counselors don't often recommend other strategies or if they do it's very rare but what handicaps if i'm if i'm in a i'm calling a credit oh, this is a credit counselor they're going to give me advice they're educated they're certified yeah. they know what they're talking about they're going to give me this good advice because they're a counselor well what handicaps that counselor from telling me something else that might not be enrolled in our program because it's not a good fit for you well right? yeah and do they at least minimum have bias towards not enrolling in the program. Well, there, there are two things, I think, that contribute to that. One is, uh, I don't care who you work for, there's some sort of evaluation or supervision of all the employees about, you know, how many people did you let us help or bring to our organization, whatever you want to call it, um, or, you know, sell. The other thing is that, in my experience, credit counseling's best sales strategy was always about how terrible bankruptcy was. And so yeah. if debt settlement is all scammers and bankruptcy is terrible and horrible and it's going to ruin your life, then employees feel like 
ta-da, we have the best solution, which, yeah. And honestly, most of these employees don't have the background, the experience, the education to know any better. Right. So that's why you said, like, meaningful, you know, helpful, but ignorance on fire is still ignorant. Yeah. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Well, yeah, and, sounds good. Yeah, but <laughs> and we've seen we've seen very similar things in the debt settlement industry. You and I have talked to enough debt settlement salespeople behind the scenes where we're like, "Yeah, I don't even know what I was selling." <laughs> oh, we get stuff. We get stuff all the time, like former debt settlement salespeople. Yeah, it's almost like a confessional. They send you an email, you know, for the site. It's like I worked for this company, and once I figured out what was going on. I couldn't believe it. I was sick to my stomach. I had to get out of there. But it's just like like going back to credit counseling. And again, you can apply this to almost anything, but you don't go to a car dealership and the guy that runs out to meet right. you is like, oh, I'm the new vehicle counselor. Right. How can I help you today? Yeah. He's not a fucking counselor. <laughs> He's a new vehicle counselor the same way the person that you call when you call the credit counseling company is a credit counselor. They're not there to counsel you nor do they really have the ability no. or the green light for management to counsel you somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> well, at one time back in my credit counseling days, it, it, it didn't take me very long to learn what a bad idea this was. Uh, for a brief period of time, I had encouraged the people on uh, the front line on the phones to provide the best customer service that they could to bend over backwards. And for those people that got the best reviews, we gave some sort of reward. And what I learned from that was the only thing that ever did was incentivize them to enroll people that should not be in the program. Because I spent most of my yeah. time after that going to myself, you know, why are you in the program? <laughs> we need to move you to a better solution. And so in, yeah. if you're incentivizing people that, you know, here's where our expectation is for you to keep your job. Whether or not they're called salespeople or not, people are self-motivated to continue their employment. Well, then the business model doesn't work if it's not that, if they're not motivated to make sales, because that's where the money comes from. Remember that um, uh, car, uh, Saturn, mm -hmm. back in the day? Okay. I remember back then their whole pitch, this is, I was coming of age around when Saturn was out. So it was a big thing. So I was like 16, 17, something like that. And their whole pitch was, we have no commission salespeople. Right. Right. That was their whole thing. You come, you get a Saturn, no commission salespeople. How well is Saturn doing yeah, today? Yeah. <laughs> I'm not saying that's the reason you're not driving a Saturn, but you're not driving a Saturn. <laughs> I had an employee once. Does it work? I had an employee once. Uh, classic situation. Uh, we had a client and we were going to charge them for some sort of uh, budget program, whatever it was. And she said to me, um, that is terrible. You cannot charge this person for enrolling in that program because they're struggling and they have money problems. And I went, hey, hey, I totally understand. So how many hours are you going to donate to volunteer and work here for free to help them? <laughs> She was like, why would I do that? Well, exactly. That's my point. Because <laughs> she has money problems. Right. <laughs> yeah. But so, so let's get into like kind of like, because we didn't touch on it. Like why, what would some potential conflict, just for consumers knowledge, so they know what they're getting into. Because yeah. again, I'm, in fact, oftentimes I'll recommend to a client, depending on the situation, hey, here's what a credit counseling program could do for you. I, I, I say it might be a good idea or I don't really think it's a good idea, but I always encourage them to get the information because you can right. call a credit counseling company and I'll give them a couple names of a couple companies yeah. to call. I have no connection, no ties to. And here's my situation. They'll pull up your debts and they'll give you a quote for free. Right. So that, no harm in that. It doesn't hurt to get a couple of quotes and just to kind of see, well, what would my life be like if I did that? What would my payments be? What would my interest rate be? What creditors will they accept into the program? Because especially like personal loans, a lot of times they'll, you know, exclude those. And the problem with that is usually the personal loans are the biggest bite out of your cash flow right. as far as the debt goes. And so a lot of times they'll say, oh, we'll take these other cards, but maybe these other debts are the real problem, the bigger part of the problem, but they're not even dealing with it. So they're not putting together a total solution anyway, but it does not hurt at all to call up 
and get a quote so you can at least make some good decisions. Is that something I can handle? Is that something that makes sense? Okay, let me compare that to this other solution, right? Maybe this other right. solution makes more sense. So the key is always get the information. So we're definitely not discouraging anybody from contacting a credit counseling company, oh. getting the information and determining if it's a good fit for their situation, right? Yeah, get all the information. But, but go back to my point, what potential conflicts, like why wouldn't, to me, it would make sense. If I'm a credit counseling organization and I have funds, why wouldn't I teach my counselors to advise people and counsel people and teach them about, well, hey, you know, based on your experience, have we really looked at bankruptcy? Have well, we looked at, uh, you know, a principal negotiation strategy? Um, you know, or what about Dave Ramsey? Hey, you know, if you enroll in this program, it's going to close your cards. Have, is there any potential ramifications for you with that? What do you do for a job? And, you know, is, it is going to affect your credit a bit, right? Why don't they take the time and provide that kind of service up front to first screen people and not enroll people well, because that shouldn't be in their program. Why don't they do that? Because historically, the creditors who were funding the credit counseling operation uh, made it very clear, you cannot talk to consumers about this. And the credit counseling groups at the creditors, let's you know pick one, major creditor, um, those divisions there don't talk Bank of America. Yeah, Bank of America. Don't talk to the same people that do the debt settlement stuff. Like, I've heard from major creditors, we never settle debt. And at the same time, I know, hey, we're settling debt with your organization every day. I know you do. Yeah. <laughs> so. You're like, cool story, bro. Yeah. I mean, if you look at, there are some credit counseling groups that are trying to offer debt settlement. But they have to yeah. do it on the down low. Roadblocks. They, they, yeah. yeah. The creditors cannot know that they're doing it. Otherwise, they risk getting their funding cut. So who's in control of this stuff then? If they have yeah. to do something on the down low because they don't want to piss off the creditors, yeah. where does their allegiance lie? To well, the creditor or to you, the consumer? Because the creditors are also paying them some money right. to collect the debt. Yeah. Well, so they, they will their say- Their focus is on a kind- it's really a kinder, gentler form of debt collection. Yeah. Really, when you break it down. Yeah, it is. They're collecting the debt, and the creditors are giving them a kickback. It's gotten smaller and smaller and smaller over yeah. the years, and that's why credit counseling so, companies are getting squeezed. Yeah, they're more beholden to the creditors. Yeah. In in my beginning in 94, uh, when we started, there was none of that. Creditors never asked, you know, what are you offering or saying? We would settle debt. I would direct people, you know, towards bankruptcy. It was never a problem. It became a problem. And I actually had creditors say, if you recommend bankruptcy or if you settle debt, we will not give you any money. And yeah. I mean, I was, I was fortunate enough that I was coming up on a uh, five-year renewal of our 30,000 square feet of office space with the 70 employees that it, uh, there were lots of sleepless nights of me thinking, do do I want to be beholden to the creditors? Do I want to potentially not do the right thing for my clients? And instead, the decision that I came to, right or wrong, was um, I offered all of the employees the best severance package I could, and we all gave each other hugs and went to do something else. Yeah, because that's, I mean, when you're in a situation where the bank is essentially saying we don't want you to make any other suggestions right. to everybody. We want you to enroll everybody you can. Hmm. How how are they free to give good advice? Even you know, I'm not saying credit counselors don't want to give good advice, mm -hmm. but if their main income source is the person that you owe twenty thousand dollars to, the the entity that you owe twenty thousand dollars to, uh, it's they're you know. <laughs> They're handicapped. Yeah. Even if they wanted to tell you that this is not a good option, they can't in most cases. Yeah. And, They're not counselors. And management of credit counseling agencies doesn't wake up every morning and go, "Woo, it's another day to do good things." You know, they've got rent, you know, wages, fees. They they've got everything that they have to continue to bring in enough money to support the organization, and. You know, again, you might be very well intentioned, but at the end of the day, it's a business. Yeah, and and to be clear, I don't 
if I had a choice between debt settlement management, right, and credit counseling management, mm -hmm. I'm taking credit counseling management all day long. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying these are like bad people out there trying to scam people. I think a lot of these guys, because you know a lot of them, mm -hmm. I know some of them, you know, owners of these companies. I think a lot of them are very well intentioned. Mm -hmm. They're trying to do the right thing. They really want to help consumers. I agree. But they're just handicapped in many cases yeah. in, in what they can offer. So, again, we're not saying credit counseling companies are bad. No. We're just saying you have to go into it with eyes wide open because they're handicapped in being able to tell you other potential options that if anybody that has any experience with this stuff can look at your situation and say, this may work, but it's probably not optimal for you. There may be some other things you should look at that would be better suited for you. They can't tell you that. Right. So just know that going into it. Just look at look at the option for what it is and then look at other options as well. Damon, I have to say at this point, hey, if you listen this long, you should absolutely subscribe to this podcast on whatever platform that you're listening on. And the intention is to do uh, more of these podcasts regularly moving forward. Uh, if you need to talk to somebody, you can always reach out to Damon. Damon Day, D-A-M-O-N-D-A-Y dot com. You can find him there. And just open up. Be honest. He's, he's not going to judge you. There's nothing that you can ask Damon that neither of us have heard over our, I don't know. Or done. Combined, what, 50 years or something like that? <laughs> uh, you're very old. You really skewed the average up, bro. Okay. <laughs> very old. I mean, my 28-year-old self. No, yeah. For, for those listening on the podcast, clearly I'm not 28. <laughs> and neither am I. <laughs> but... Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, and I think next topic, definitely subscribe. I think we're going to be talking, unless we change our mind, but I think we're going to be talking about 401ks and the, you know, pros and cons of borrowing, borrowing mm -hmm. from the 401k to deal with debt. Cause there's a lot of information out there. You never do it, never do it, never do it. And I say, sometimes you should do it. Yeah. Well, so, you know, sometimes there are really good scenarios where borrowing from a 401k can make sense and sometimes there's not all right damon thank you very much see ya peace